With Tom Baker leaving the show after seven long years, the time was ripe for change. Peter Davison had huge shoes to fill and was certainly an inspired choice to be very different from Tom, with no unfair comparisons being made. Furthermore, the Fifth Doctor era was a time of celebration as Doctor Who entered its 20th anniversary with callbacks to the past scattered everywhere throughout the era. This era pull off its ambitions? Let's find out. Starting with the bottom of the barrel, we have... Number 20. Warriors of the Deep. Normally I'd sum up the problems this serial has with this one clip, but let's be fair and I'll elaborate further. Warriors of the Deep is one of Doctor Who's greatest embarrassments. Right from the start, it's absolutely clear that neither the cast or production crew want to be here. The boring reveal of the Silurians is just a shocking oversight, and there's absolutely no attempt to build up any menace, and they walk and talk at an absolute snail's pace. At times, the Silurian dialogue is barely audible, and since they hardly ever say anything that's worth listening to, that's not a huge problem, I guess? And also, the Sea Devil counterparts walk at a snail's pace too, so neither of the reptilian races has to hang around, waiting for the other as they walk, walk, and walk through the sea base at a snail's pace. The action scenes are equally as lethargic, the base personnel just stand in a line waiting to be shot down. Compare any of these action scenes with stories like Earthshot, Caves of Androzani, or even Resurrection of the Daleks, and you can see the difference between a director working with what they have, despite the limitations, and a director who's clearly given up. Merka, like its reptilian master, is equally as slow and crap, and will easily go down as one of the worst realised monsters in Doctor Who history. If the inclusion of the Silurians and Sea Devils and the base under siege format was supposed to be a love letter to the Pertwee and Troughton era, I would just feel insulted. This serial was a production nightmare for all involved, but unlike stories such as Warrior's Gate or The Mind Robber where the production pulls through despite their shortcomings, this is just like watching a train crash that just gets worse and worse. I mean, we can blame Margaret Thatcher for this, but there really should have been another way. Number 19. Time Flight. I debated putting this story or Warriors of the Deep as the worst, and don't get me wrong, this serial is awful. But at least it can be funny in a so bad it's good way? Regardless, time travelling Concorde crash landing on prehistoric Earth is a crazy enough concept, if this was from a fresh writer who had no idea about the show, but coming from Peter Grimwade, a director who understands the technical difficulties and budget restrictions, this is just pure lunacy. It's not just that the story looks hideously cheap or that the plot is told entirely through exposition and pantomime antics, the very ideas at the heart of this story are just so unconvincing and lame, you couldn't even jumpstart this even if you had decent characters, strong dialogue, or, at the very least, production values. Imagine if Khalid had turned out not to be the master, he would have been the crappest villain we have ever witnessed. And before the reveal, you just have to ask yourself, why? But afterwards, you have to ask yourself, why? Why on earth does he dress up like this? What is the point? Does he dress up in these disguises so he can see the look on the Doctor's face when he transforms? Because he sure as heck ain't impressing me. Ugh. Everything about Time Flight is just an embarrassment. Peter Grimwade may have been one of the best directors of the 80s, but his writing left a lot to be desired. For being excruciatingly boring and the worst story to feature the master, Time Flight will forever go down as one of the worst stories ever. Let's just go to the next one. Number 18. King's Demons. Typically, two parters of this era would be short and sweet filler. This story is the biggest waste of time I've ever seen from Doctor Who. Whilst the historical setting of medieval England is nice, this sorry tale reveals that all of those skills that were present in the pure Hartnell historicals of the 60s have been completely sapped and lost as the genre became unpopular and all you're left with is a stagey pantomime that lacks just conviction. The setting is poor, the dialogue is enough to get stuck in your throat, the characters are just vacuums and unbelievable, and the plot isn't worth wasting your time in. I mean, how exactly does the Doctor know the Master wants to rid the world of Magna Carta? They don't even utter a single word on this subject. By stating its small-time villainy by the Master's standards, it's like the writer is admitting that even this plot is just shite. 
But at least we've got this robot that can shapeshift. I can't wait to see all the great things they do with him. Oh wait, let's just stick him in a cupboard until he leaves in the following season because we can't use it. I mean, why not just hire a new actor each week to play Chameleon? It's a fun enough concept. No one bothered to think of this and being the biggest waste of time and introducing a shit crap robot. You have virtually no reason to watch The King's Demons. Number 17. Arc of Infinity. This story frustrates me because there was potential here. I just don't think it was explored or executed well enough. Though it could be a combination of both. Let's say, let's say both. Arc of Infinity features two equally ponderous plots that fail to gel and direction that sabotages the drama on just every level. The cameras just stand still, exposing the script deficiencies, the actor's stiffness and the wooden dialogue, and the general cheapness of everything. I find it hard to believe that a story where the Doctor is forced back to Gallifrey and assassinated and ends with him murdering a Gallifreyan hero could be this boring and tedious, but wow, did they succeed! The second overseas location shoot should be something to celebrate, but unlike the romance and adventurous spirit of Paris and City of Death, you've just got an appalling plod around Amsterdam, which makes it look like just a boring holiday destination. Add to this list of deficiencies is a skeletal chicken with a gun, the most bizarre pair of squatters I've ever seen, a bunch of artificially characterised time lords, headache-inducing music, and a villain who only makes an impact in the last 15 minutes, and the lead actor who just seems bored of the whole thing and is making the least amount of effort to inject any drama into this. The biggest crime Ark of Infinity commits is that I feel nothing whilst watching it, and that's all I have to say about it. Number 16. Four to Doomsday. Here's a fun fact for you, none of the regulars were happy with Four to Doomsday. Peter Davison was unhappy with his performance as the first story he ever filmed, Janet Fielding objected to the foreign language being referred to in the script as gibberish, Sarah Sutton was nearly written out of the show, and Matthew Waterhouse didn't get why Adric was helping the villain Monarch. I'm glad the cast share my sentiments, because I don't like this story either. From a production standpoint, I can't really fault this one, as you really get the sense you're on a gigantic spaceship, but this lick of gloss over what's a second-rate script full of boring ideas, dodgy characterisation, and just a lack of action. If there was ever an argument against filling the TARDIS with companions, this story proves it with flying colours. The story just meanders along at a boring pace with little interest, failing to generate any excitement or tension from the trio of villains, a stilted science lecture that lacks logic, entertainment value, and just a massive misstep for the Fifth Doctor's um, characterisation. Fall to Doomsday may look pretty, but I can't find much to like about this serial, so let's just move on. Number 15. Planet of Fire. Okay, let's see. Writing out Thurlow. Check. Killing off the Master. Check. Introducing Perry. Check. Getting rid of Chameleon. Check. Include Lanzarote as the primary location. Check. And do you see the fucking problem yet? This isn't a story, it's just a checklist. Planet of Fire tries to do too many things and winds up being just unmemorable. It wants to be an exit story for Turlo with revelations about his background. It wants to be an introduction story for Perry, a continuation of the Master storyline, a, a religion versus science tale about the planet on the brink of destruction. Because none of these plot threads have any time to just breathe, we get individual scenes that can be good, but the actual story is just drawn out and just anti-climaxes. It's a gorgeous looking story with lush location work, and a great score helped to smooth over some of the rougher edges, but Planet of Fire is such mishmash of good and bad, it's just really hard to judge. It's a pretty average tale on the whole, and it's mostly aesthetics, and some interplay between the Doctor Turlo and Perry does keep it afloat. But while it's not as nearly as bad as the previous stories on this list, Planet of Fire looks pretty, but it's not enough to save an average script. Number 14. Terminus. I really want to like this serial, as there is a lot going for it, but it just doesn't quite work for me. The script is actually pretty good, and it's full of dark, seedy ideas, and in particular, its first episode is a really good scene setter for the rest of the serial. Terminus is a horror story in space, and needed just more atmosphere and a sober score to bring its creepy ideas to the screen. There are clunky action scenes, dual sets, and a lack of sparkle, you are probably going to lose interest in the later episodes, 
And it's a shame because there is some intelligent detail and realism in the script. Now, given the, the pressure the production team was under due to strike action, it was a miracle this story was completed at all. The idea of a ship being in flight and dumping an unstable amount of fuel which was ejected into the void causing a chain reaction, i.e. the Big Bang that created the universe, that's a pretty solid sci-fi idea to build a Doctor Who story around. The pilot jumped forward and the shockwave caught up billions of years in the future and killed him and damaged the second engine, whereas the first explosion created the universe, the second would destroy it. And it's one of the few times the entire universe is put in jeopardy, and I just would find it a huge shame it couldn't have been executed with as much skill as it was written. It is a good time paradox story. I really like the idea of the uncertainty of the ending. It's no easy solution and there's a lot of work ahead of them, but it makes for a realistic conclusion. Terminus does have good ideas on a script level, but the sets are underdressed, it's featureless and just very unmemorable, which might have been the idea, but the result is that there's nothing here to feast your eyes on but empty blackness, and it just gets boring and monotonous very quickly. Crossing the line into the forbidden zone about diseases should be a terrifying prospect, but in this uh, cheap production, it turns out to be duct tape on the floor and a great hairy dog that's just escaped from a kid's holiday park. Everything has just fallen to pieces come episode 3. Terminus is slap bang in the middle of the 5th Doctor era, both story and quality wise in my opinion. Whenever I think of something good, I immediately think of its shortcomings, so take it for what it's worth and maybe you can draw your own conclusions. Number 13. Maldrin Undead. Okay, if you're a huge 5th Doctor fan and you're finding me to be very negative in this video, rest assured we're now firmly into the good category for the 5th Doctor era. This is by far Peter Grimwade's strongest script for the series. It juggles a lot of interesting ideas, such as dual timelines, two brigadiers, the Doctor regenerating into an alien, Nyssa and Tegan being infected by time, and the Doctor sacrificing his remaining lives. The writer manages to tie all of these ideas into an engaging, fast-paced narrative that tosses aside the usual 80s obsession for set pieces and just tries to be a bit more thoughtful with it. Morgan Undead alone does contain a number of really clever ideas, my favourite being that the living death that, Mor that the titular Mordrin and his subordinates suffer, it's a poetic consequences of their crime and lust for immortality. It's great to see the Brigadier again, and really nice to give Nicholas Courtney the chance to play two different versions. It's not as good as Inferno, but it's still cool to see. While it is way too busy in its plot department, it never feels boring or lethargic. Certainly an energy to the production that a lot of other serials this era suffered. For being a fun, nostalgic and bonkers watch, Morgan Undead is breezy entertainment that certainly provides on an entertainment factor. That's enough to recommend. Number 12. The Awakening. I'm a sucker for old English village settings in Doctor Who. The Awakening is no exception. It's an overlooked and rather charming little two-parter with snappy dialogue, a rare moment of a companion interacting with family, and a really good supporting cast. The main villain of the piece, the Malice, may be restricted by being stuck in the church and not having any dialogue, but despite this, the top-notch set design and haunting sound effects represent its malevolent influence that give it a really good screen presence. There are issues, of course, underlying the story. The plot is rather flawed, with some of the reasoning behind the Malice and the need for war games being a bit flimsy, and some of the guest characters are underserved by the story, in particular the almost significant role of Tegan's grandfather, but it just feels like an afterthought as he has barely any interactions with Tegan, and it just serves no real purpose to the story other than an excuse for the TARDIS to land in the village. I do understand this is partly down to the format of the classic series, but it's just a weakness regardless. This story receives little attention compared to other Peter Davison stories, and it is often forgotten by fans in a season with quite some big highs and lows, and I would recommend giving it a second watch. It's easy to, as it's only 50 minutes, and it's not really very complicated to follow. Even though you are likely to notice some of its flaws, it's still a fascinating story with great imagery, ideas and performances. Awakening is a short and sweet two-parter that's very easy to watch, and it wouldn't feel out of place that much in the new series. Number 11. Astrovalva. An energetic and glorious, sedate, warm and wonderful opening story to introduce the Fifth Doctor. The first two episodes are a really bold and imaginative way to introduce this new incarnation and a brand new set of regulars that are trapped inside the TARDIS and trying to heal the Doctor, and they're getting used to each other and falling into one of the Master's most devious traps. 
However, the following two episodes are just as good as we move out of the TARDIS and go to the titular city of Castrovalva. It's ironic that it's a made-up location because it feels like one of the most realistic cities that the show has ever given us. It's a bustling town full of life and packed with lovely details such as the washerwomen, hunters and a unique poetic dialogue of their own. The sets are marvellously designed and built with imperial pillars, marble steps, balconies and flaming torches, all mixing to create a rich atmosphere. And it's such a shame really that this is all just an elaborate ruse by the master. It's visually and tonally, there's never been much like this before and since, and it's certainly a new, unique entry of the Fifth Doctor era, and debut serials for a new Doctor, and it kicks off the Peter Davison era with style, and that's certainly enough to recommend. Number 10. Frontios. Whenever I watch it, this serial, it gives me a tantalising peek into what this era could have been if Christopher H. Bidmead stayed on for script editor post-season 18, because there's some great ideas in Frontios, there's an end of the world scenario, the terrifying prospect of being eaten by the earth, giant insects burrowing away below the ground, the destruction of the TARDIS, a vivid doctor, resourceful companions who are afforded strong developments, great guest characters, snappy dialogue, and a plot that has many layers and a strong scientific core, but remembering to entertain you as well. There's plenty of detail to be found, in the script that helps to sell the situation that is translated into the design of the piece. Now for once in the 80s Doctor Who, it feels like everybody's working in the same direction. It's a story that manages to successfully evolve from a creepy horror tale, such as the mystery of people being dragged beneath the earth in the first two episodes, into a really superb sci-fi adventure, the last episode playing a part with some weighty concepts and presenting some impressive imagery. Pontius does get a lot of things right that the Davison era would often get wrong, it's genuinely scary, as characters you care about and the regulars are appealing. I can skip over the rough edges of the story. Traptators and the occasional embarrassing moments of static action do let the story down, but Frontios is rather good and it does stand out. It may not be a season opener or a regeneration story, it may not feature Daleks, Cybermen or The Master, and it may be mid-season filler, but it gets my vote for a really entertaining narrative, showing what can be done by ditching kisses to the past and simply getting on with telling a thumping good story. While it may be clumsy in areas, Frontios easily makes its way to the top 10 stories of the Fifth Doctor era. Number 9. Fat Orchid. First pure historical since 1966, I understand it's popular to dislike Black Orchid for feeling out of place in the 80s, heck even the regular cast don't like it that much, but I find it to be a refreshing breath of fresh air. Abandoning heavy plotting and tangled up continuity in favour of atmosphere and hijinks, it's incredible fun to watch the Doctor and friends just having fun at a 1920s party. At two episodes, it's a very breezy watch, and one aspect I appreciate is that there's no real villain here, but just a rather tragic family secret that the upper class obviously hide away. In the aesthetics, there's just something so British about the TARDIS landing on a train platform and the team being carted off to a cricket game and then a nice costume party. I understand I ragged on King's Demons for being a waste of time, but where that story fails and this story succeeds is that Black Orchid has atmosphere and everyone looks like they're having a blast to playing this. For being a stylish historical, not particularly heavy on plot, Black Orchid will go down as an easy watch for me that I love watching on those warm summer nights. Number 8. The Visitation Notable for the twist of the Doctor causing the Great Fire of London in 1666, The Visitation still has much going for it, and I can see why this is one of Peter Davison's favourites. One of those simple but thoroughly solid Doctor Who stories that are effective at providing a weekend's worth of entertainment. It's not really groundbreaking, and it does feel like a traditional story from another era of the show, but it's a nice breather. After experimental stories like Castrovalva and Kinder, this season definitely needed a simpler story to keep its audience coming back with enthusiasm. Crisp location filming is beautifully lush, and it looks even better on Blu-ray thanks to the restoration team. There's just a sense of total atmosphere that fits in with the 17th century aesthetic. Terraleptals are really great villains with a striking design, and Michael Melia playing the Terraleptal leader character enough gravitas and menace for him to feel like a threat. Terraleptal's belief in survival of the fittest is a nice touch, because it makes the situation a little less black and white than typical alien conquerors. For this particular viewing, I have to compliment the costume designer and makeup artist, the Terraleptal costume is very good for the most part. 
There's something about the way its jaw moves when it's speaking, and how it gruesomely melts when the Pudding Lane Bakery is burning down, that's very effective in making it feel less like a man in a rubber suit. The other great guest star, of course, is Michael Robbins as Richard Mace. He's such a delightful rogue, and his manner of speech enables him to sound authentically like a real 17th century person. He often steals the show, and it would have been great to have him around as a companion. For being a simple but effective story, The Visitation is best enjoyed on a crisp Halloween night with a fireplace blazing. Number 7. Enlightenment Visual of sailing ships flying through the stars highlighted by the coroner of the sun is a captivating image, and Enlightenment still offers so much to enjoy. The Eternals are a fantastic creation, they're bored immortal entities feeding on human imagination like parasites, when and whilst they've been name dropped in the new series a few times, I would like to see them back again in a new story. Imaginative, enchanting, dramatic and even exciting, Enlightenment is just packed to the brim with greatness, with the Dr. Tegan and Turlow and all of the guest cast getting their time to shine, which I find to be a miracle in early 80s stories. I really cannot fault this story much, the dialogue is like a rich wine, the story continually finds inventive things to show us and the conclusion wraps up everything very satisfying. I find it a very pleasing story, this good should not only be nestled firmly during a more maligned 80s era of Doctor Who, but Enlightenment is simply fantastic that I still have a lot of fun watching. Number 6. Resurrection of the Daleks Putting aside the awful special effects, seriously if this serial doesn't get a CGI update for its eventual Blu-ray release, I am going to scream in the streets. Resurrection of the Daleks still has a lot going for it, that can also be its detriment. Yes, it is pretty t violent, and yes, it is nasty and too complicated, it's still ridiculously entertaining. Once the Daleks feel like a terrifying, violent force that cannot be opposed, and Davros makes a very welcome return, with writer Eric Sayward setting up some interesting tension between him and the Daleks. Barry Malloy was a superb casting choice as Davros, and he manages to get under the skin of the character like Michael Wisher did, silky voiced and just genuinely psychotic. There are times when he pushes the hysterical ranting to the limit, but he comes across as a raving child and it's somehow even more frightening. Matthew Robinson's direction is worthy of praise, as he never keeps the camera still and is constantly finding ways of making the action dynamic and looking like the budget was ten times its size. Peter Davison gives another impressive last season performance and his doctor is pushed further over the edge than ever before. It makes you wonder how much longer this kinder incarnation can make a difference in such an ugly universe. He needs to regenerate into someone tougher and more violent in order to face these horrors head on. While it is a very busy story, it is ridiculously entertaining, but I'm going to have to leave it just shy of the top 5. Number 5. Snake Dance Fun fact, this is writer Rob Sherman's favourite Doctor Who story, and I can certainly see why. This is how formidable Doctor Who can be when everything comes together like a perfect door puzzle. Snake Dance is much more concerned with character, setting, atmosphere, and intelligent dialogue than glossy set pieces and pacey action, and while that certainly has its place in the show, it is nice when Doctor Who can pull off this style of story so well. The characterisation of the Doctor is just fascinating, I find here. He's basically treated as an irrelevance, but with purpose this time around, and Davison plays the part of the impotent portent of doom to the hilt with fine support from Nyssa, who once again proves she is the ideal companion for this Doctor. Snake Dance is a great story for Tegan as well, with all the complexities and scares of Kinder, giving her a substantial role in this story too. Not much to fault in this story beyond the fact that it has a very stagey feel because of the heightened performances and studio bound exteriors, but even that feels kind of deliberate. This feels like a really strong theatre play with a rock solid plot and truly engaging characters, and I can see it transferring to the stage with a minimum of fuss. You'd think the explanation of how the Mara came to be would be unsatisfying. The writer Christopher Bailey gives us such a clever answer in that the Minusans blindly brought the Mara into being themselves amplifying their mental forces including restlessness, hate, greed, reflecting it, and creating a mental force so malevolent it turned on them in a reign of terror. Given we've already encountered the Mara before in season 19's Kinder, the revelations are much more satisfying because we have had to wait for them. 
And that's why the third episode, which can often be seen as filler in some of these four-parters, doesn't hit, because Snake Dance does have the Doctor locked up in a cage for 25 minutes, and the villains preparing for their evil plan, but it, rather than doing anything malicious, because the information fed to us in the first two episodes converges in this instalment, to spill out the nature of the Mara and the scope of its malevolence, it makes the stakes so much more higher. Whilst they were briefly mentioned in Torchwood, I would love to see the Mara return to the series, but if this is their final story on TV, it is such a strong serial to go out on. Number 4. The Five Doctors 20th Anniversary Special has the feel of a massive party and it succeeds with flying colours. Five Doctors is ridiculously entertaining and in many places inspired, it gives every participant a priceless moment. This doesn't feel like Terran Sticks, the writer, has dumped a load of doctors, companions and monsters together, but a rock-solid narrative with clear plot progression and plenty of space for great set pieces. If you ever needed proof of the skill of this writer, then bask at the menagerie of continuity and how well it all hangs together. The Five Doctors is just marvellous to watch throughout. You don't even need to know all these past doctors and companions to be invested. The story grabs you by both hands and takes you on a wonderful adventure with plenty of old friends and enemies thrown in for good measure. I'm just so in awe of the Five Doctors and how this easily could have collapsed under its own weight, but it works so unbelievably well. I did a 38 minute review of this story a few years ago, so if you want more information, go check that out. And for being such a perfect anniversary special, The Five Doctors is best enjoyed with cake, tea, and surrounded by friends. Number 3. Kinder Back to the brim of psychological horror and surreal sequences, Kinder will forever stand as not just one of the highlights of the Fifth Doctor era, but 80s Doctor Who in general. Putting aside the rubbish-looking snake at the end, the main theme of Kinder is colonialism, the crew being the most obvious example of that, like Commander Sanders playing the role of the archetypal old British military type that strolls into a foreign land and does whatever he wants, disregarding the indigenous folk as just savages, and despite his science officer's best efforts of convincing him otherwise, there's also their military uniforms which are styled to look like Victorian ones and the very iconic hats. It's not a very subtle metaphor, but it works. And another motif of this theme is the ancient evil being released by a foreigner who is unfamiliar and disrespectful of the traditions of the natives when Tegan releases the Mara by mistake. Also, since the Mara can move from person to person, it could also be a reference to the spread of diseases by the Europeans who colonised Central America. The dream sequences are equally as fantastic and could have looked laughable, but end up being one of the scariest sequences in classic Doctor Who. Kinder is maturely written, extraordinarily well acted, and wouldn't really push the boundaries of Doctor Who until the Seventh Doctor era, but for being so unique and experimental, it stands out as one of the Fifth Doctor's highlights, and just an incredible story. Number 2. Earthshock. This was the first classic Doctor Who story I ever watched, and I would certainly recommend this serial for any first timers. And no, this isn't just the nostalgia talking. One of the most dynamically directed classic Doctor Who series with all the crew working to make Earthshock as exciting and as atmospheric as possible, it's a remarkably sturdy production with a terrific look. Both the caves and the freighter scenes are realistic, shadowy locations and everything from costumes to hardware add to the sense of reality that director Peter Grimwade is determined to push. Cybermen make an impressive return to the series, appearances give an excellent build-up in the unforgettably tense first episode, and their strength of numbers and insanely ambitious plans are more impressive than ever. Peter Davison gives the most confident performance of his debut season, and all the regulars get a time to shine. Rick Sayward might not be the most sophisticated of scriptwriters, but the way he stacks the threat in this story so they escalate towards that unforgettable ending is just elegant, and he includes so many impressive set pieces along the way. Earthshock is such a dynamically directed action serial, and featuring one of the best first episode cliffhangers, and definitely one of the finest companion exits, Earthshock takes risks and wins and sees an annoying companion depart the series in true style. For being the first classic Dot 2 story I ever watched, this would be the number one choice for the Davison era, but that honour goes to... Number 1. Caves of Andrazani Davison era certainly had its ups and downs more than any other Doctor so far on these videos, but my god did they save the best till last. The approach to Andrazani, the TARDIS landing on the foggy sands, the voiceover, the long shot with the mountains in the distance, this story just hits you and makes an 
impression on impact. And climaxing the Fifth Doctor's era with style, this is Doctor Who at its most devastating, downbeat, violent and dramatic. Caves of Androzani is the most powerful classic Doctor Who story, features Robert Holmes' tightest script, with razor-sharp characters, a frantic pace, dialogue bristling with confidence, a stunningly satisfying final episode. Director Graham Harper makes his personal mission to make this story as stylish and dynamic as possible, and he kicks off his astounding run of stories with blissfully high production values, and it's no wonder this director was brought back to handle episodes in the revived series. Just saying. The highest praise needs to go to Peter Davison though, and he takes hold of this awesome opportunity to show his audience everything he is capable of as an actor. He's just so astonishingly good here. This has been touted as the best Doctor Who story of all time, and whilst there are a handful I would say are personal favourites of mine, it is so good that I can completely buy into its reputation as one of Doctor Who's greatest achievements. It's just another example of how great 80s Doctor Who could be when it pulled out all the stops and delivered phenomenal television. So going through the Fifth Doctor era again, there are certainly huge highlights to be found here, but also depressing lows as well. But while there may be cracks, I'm sure Doctor Who will survive in the 80s, right? We've gone through 20 years now, so surely we have a long future with Doctor Who, right? Well, I'll see you next time when the Sixth Doctor will be making its brash, loud and colourful debut in the most turbulent era of the show so far. I'll see you then.